get started. Good morning. Welcome to today's episode of Urban Green Live with our guest, Ian Shapiro. I'm Ellen Honigstock, Senior Director of Education at Urban Green Council. Urban Green's values are excellence, inclusion, collaboration, and engagement. We invite you to be mindful of these during the program, both when you're listening in and asking questions. And now I'd like to turn it over to our CEO, John Mandyke. Alan, thank you. Good morning, everybody. We're really happy that you're with us. Um, let's bring Ian on camera, our special guest today. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm John Mandyke. I'm your host for Urban Green Live. I'm the CEO of Urban Green. Um, this is a program series where we dive into big questions with experts about how we get to a net zero carbon future. And you get to participate too, because we're going to have live Q&A in just a bit. So today we're going to dive into pathways to electrification. And I couldn't think of a better guest to do that with than Ian Shapiro, who's just joined us. He's the founder and co-owner of Tatum Engineering and a professor of practice for mechanical and aerospace engineering at Syracuse University. Ian is one of New York's leading experts on building electrification. He recently helped the city of Ithaca develop a local energy code that reduces carbon emissions by 80% of new buildings and will require fossil fuel free new buildings starting in 2026. So Ian, welcome to Urban Green Live. Thank you so much, John. It's always a treat to do anything with Urban Green. Um, you've been a big supporter and, and 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 stimulated so much activity down there. Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, we're we're uh, honored that you're spending a few minutes with us today, Ian. So thank you. So there's a lot going on in Ithaca uh, with electrification, and there's no surprise that you are at the very center of it. Let's start with new construction. You helped write the code. What does it require? Uh, the code came out in 2021. When it came out, it required 40% less carbon in new buildings, anything from a mobile home to a university you know, lab, um, anything and everything. So this is the city of Ithaca and the town of Ithaca, two separate municipalities. Um, the town is a donut around the city. So, um, 2021, 40% less carbon, 2023, so that is January 1st of this year, it went to 80% less carbon. It's hard to comply today without being electrified. It's still possible, but hard. And then January 1st, 2026, it's fossil fuel free and uh, net zero. So there's a requirement for either on-site or remote renewables. Um, you nicely gave me credit for it. I have to tell you that um, the, the city and the town from day one have been moving way faster than me or than Tatum or than the environmentalists. I proposed 2030 for net zero and both the city council and the town board said, no, we want it faster. And they accelerated it to 2026. So one message for all of us is I think that our clients and our constituents and the city and the state are moving in many cases faster than we are. And we need to be ready for it because otherwise we, like I did, are gonna be caught flat-footed. We'll be behind them. The demand and the movement is so fast. And so what's the market reaction been to the 2026 date? We went through a very careful process. And so I, th I think it's been generally accepting. We don't have people protesting in the streets. We don't have developers protesting in the streets. <laughs> um, I I've got a remarkable story. We have a developer up here who is very active in a certain movement that involves red hats. Have you heard about the red hat movement? Um, and that developer has fallen in love with heat pumps. He has hundreds of new apartments that are all heated with heat pumps. And he is, you know, belongs to a difficult, different uh, political party than me. So really things are moving fast and we're all moving fast. We have 
thousands of heat pumps in Ithaca already before the local code went into effect. So um, things are moving fast. It's very exciting. Right. And so talk to us about existing buildings. What, uh, what's the plan there? So when, um, you know, around the time, the, the, we call it the Ithaca Energy Code Supplement. That's the new construction, local code. It's fully in compliance with the state energy code. It was approved by the Department of State. On, on, on local buildings, around that time, the city council uh, passed a law that's very somewhat similar to the CLCPA. It commits the city to, um, by 2030, to carbon neutral. And so, you know, the activity around existing buildings, always harder, has started. So it started with uh, initiatives, the Heat Smart program, the whole Heat Smart program that's now spread around the state started in Tompkins County. That was an offshoot of our Solarize program. So they did um, 100 plus existing buildings, mainly homes. And then, um, so that's already, uh, my gosh, over 10 years ago. Then we had a local Finger Lakes Climate Fund started. It's a, um, they raise money from people who are traveling and wanting to offset carbon. And they invest in electrification and carbon emission reduction in existing buildings for people of low income. They add on to the state's home performance program, and Empower program. That's been successful. We've, we've had over a hundred homes done through that program. So in the process, let's say we're getting a, a knowledge base. It's slow and it's hard. Um, we're starting to see it move beyond that. We've started to see some activity, a uh, small activity in multifamily. Uh, Finger Lakes Climate Fund is just starting a multifamily pilot. And, um, and then most recently, maybe two years ago, the city awarded a contract to Block Power to uh, bring their model, it's a private sector model, to Ithaca. So that's, uh, they've been trying to get off the ground. They don't have a lot of uptake yet, but that's another city initiative. And um, we've got a lot of work to do in seven years. You know, existing buildings are hard, period. They're hard. And um, we, so you know, I've got thoughts about that outside of Ithaca, but we can, we can talk about that later. We're, we're, seeing, we're seeing some nice activity in New York City. Um, but we're going to have to ramp up. I've heard, you know, the whole thing is what model you bring, right? Is it a uh, is it an incentive model? Is it a mandatory model? You know, um, so everyone's trying a, a different model right now. Let's talk about the market readiness for electrification for for how you see it. Um, you know, we were talking about we all have our own story, right? I have my own story. I have family in Ithaca, um, own a small business. Um, the boiler went down. Tried to get a heat pump and. The, whatever contractor they were using saying, oh, well, you know, it's going to take you three months. Um, so is, is that really true? Is like, is there a, is there a supply issue for heat pumps or is this a workforce availability issue? Like, how do you see market readiness? I think it's workforce. Uh, by the way, I just saw that Biden has come out with a defense production act initiative for heat pumps. Um, I'm not too worried about heat pump availability. I may be wrong. It, well, the workforce is, is, a, is a disaster. We don't have enough contracts. We probably in Ithaca have 15 to 20 contractors for a small city. It's you know, a lot of contractors and they still they, they're nowhere close to keeping up with demand. We put in a heat pump in a duplex. It took a year to get the job done. Um, so it's real. Um, and I, I've heard that NYSERDA has a nice, a nice initiative. There's, there's this issue of readiness when a boiler or furnace fails. And, um, 
And what we really, you know, when, when a boiler furnace fails, it's the middle of winter, it's the middle of the night usually, right? And they need heat, not two days from now, not three days, they need heat like the same day. Um, so I was talking to somebody at NYSERDA, uh, I think Loic, and Loic said they've got a nice initiative going around readiness so that when a fossil fuel heating system goes down, there are uh, emergency heaters readily available. There are contractors readily available. There's equipment readily available. It's a great time to replace stuff because when something has failed, the owner's going to be investing in a replacement. So uh, incrementally, we all know it's the best time to put in a heat pump, but we need to be ready. We need to have emergency heat ready and we need to have equipment ready. And for larger buildings, we need to have designs ready. Yeah. Um, so how do we address this workforce issue? Like, does Ithaca have plans to ramp up installers or like, you know, how, how should we approach this? Let's start with the city of Ithaca, but then just writ large for, for New York State and, you know, soon thereafter New York City. Uh, there's there's local attempts, there's local initiatives. It's just moving slowly. I, I have a friend, he, um, he runs uh, adult education for BOCES in Ithaca. He's trying to find a trainer to give a 40 hour. He's got students this summer. He's got a 40 hour advertised program on heat pump installation and he can't find somebody to deliver the training. So it's not only the installers, we're, we're looking for the trainers. Um, it, it, and we're seeing the same thing at my firm, right? We're, we're shorthanded to do the engineering work. I've come to the conclusion that we all need to train ourselves. Um, it doesn't help when I go poach an engineer from another firm or from a competitor, that's not adding to the workforce. And so I think, you know, with the state's help, with the city's help, all of us need to be training people and not worrying about if those people leave, if those people leave, you know, you know all the power to them. Uh, we need to train ourselves, and um, and and we need obviously support from the city and state. So, we've been dancing around, but what we're talking about really here is market transformation, and we've been on a on a scale of that for a long time. Um, you know, there's two theories of market transformation: it's either voluntary or it's mandatory. Um, we seem to be edging to the mandatory side of it, but how, how, do you, how have you seen the evolution of market transformation here for green buildings, electrification, and what do you think is the right approach? When we started the project for the uh, local energy code, the zero energy code for city of Ithaca and town of Ithaca, we, we, there was a study, we did a study and we looked at various options for greening at that time that you know, it was greening the new buildings and the, the impetus was reducing carbon but uh, they call it the green building policy and we looked at different options we looked at market penetration for um you know elective programs programs voluntary programs so that would be clean heat lead energy star hers you know all of these voluntary programs very good wonderful well-intentioned programs that we've all grown up on. And we looked at the market penetration and the market penetration is like, it's way under 10% for the best of them. I mean, I don't think LEED has achieved a market penetration of two, three, 4% at best. And it's the biggest success and it's been fabulous. It's been fabulous for the industry, but market penetration is, is not there. And we came to the firm conclusion that this stuff won't happen without uh, without it being mandatory. And so that's why we went with an energy code rather than an incentive program. Um, and that's that's kind of where I am. And, and I see Ithaca, you know, a city of 50,000 people and New York City, what do you have, 10 million people, you know, at the two ends of the spectrum and and really being the most advanced in the state. I think what New York City did with Local Law 84 
and local law 87 and now and now local law 97 with the requirement for reduced carbon emissions that is bold and brave and that is the only thing that will work for sure the market penetration of elective programs of voluntary programs just is not there it's a nice way to stimulate activity it's a nice way to learn things it will not get you to scale um I, I, you know, John, I divide everything into, um, I mentioned this, uh, demonstration phase stuff. So that's maybe research, you know, fewer than 10 installations. That's demonstration. Then there's pilot. That's anything between 10 and 100 or 10 and 1,000. And then there's production. There's working to scale. And, and I think of technology and I think of programs and policies in those mixes. And, um, and I think we need to be concerned that we're doing a little too much demonstration stuff. The demonstration stuff is really exciting, right? Um, but we need to move to scale. You, you know, another project that I just think is fabulous is NYCHA's uh, Clean Heat for All. They moved almost immediately to a purchase order 30,000 heat pumps, window heat pumps, a product that didn't exist. Okay, they moved. Now they, they, are, doing a, uh, they are doing a demonstration pilot of about 30, but, but they've already cut the purchase order for 30,000 heat pumps. And so, you know, that is what we need to do. They created, they have stimulated so much activity. We now have at least they, they awarded two contracts. We have at least four companies now scrambling to develop window heat pumps. It's fabulous. And how do they do it? They cut a purchase order. You know? And I think it's that kind of thinking that's going to get us to scale. Let's, um, let's jump and talk about uh, technology. Um, you, you eased right into one of my questions. Um, so I know you worked on that NYCHA spec uh for um for for those products um at, how excited are you about these like uh window type heat pumps like the nitro one is a saddle one yeah. i understand there are some that look and operate like uh, the old-fashioned room air conditioner where the sash comes down on it what are you seeing and where is that technology going are these niche products or is this really the answer for urban electrification well it's an answer um, I'm very excited about it. The, um, you know, the, the NYCHA spec says it needs to be able to plug into the wall. It needs to be able to plug into a 15 amp existing receptacle. Um, I think that we need to make sure we can get rid of the condensate reliably and affordably. If we can get rid of the condensate, and that's also defrost meltwater without getting too geeky, but both summertime condensate and wintertime defrost water. If we can get rid of those, the, the, the holy grail is if we can get rid of them into the airstream outdoors. That's what we're, we'd like. If we can do that, then you can go down to Best Buy, bring it home and plug it in yourself. If we can't get rid of it that way, if we're gonna need plumbing, indoors or outdoors, then it's still a contractor, contractor installation. Either way, I'm excited. I, I, and I'm convinced that the future of heat pumps is room-based heat pumps. And they will get smaller and smaller because our you know, new buildings, our loads are coming down. It will end up with, with a wall hung appliance for sure, for sure. But in the short term, these window heat pumps have a place because you know, in medium and high rise buildings in multi multifamily, uh, it starts to get hard to, it's, po it's always possible, but it's harder and, and more costly to route piping and, and to locate the outdoor units on the roof or on the ground or on the wall. It's, 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 it's totally possible. I always say we can do it anywhere, but the cost starts to grow. If we come out with a window heat pump and then hopefully a through wall uh, heat pump, a PTAC heat pump, uh, it's, 
um, that's where we're going to go for sure. And it will help solve many, many problems. You know, it won't, it won't, may not take care of an office building, but multifamily, it's, it's going to be very helpful. Let's, uh, let's stick here in New York City. Um, you're on the team helping to design the Department of Housing Preservation and Development's electrification program here in New York. So tell us about the HPD program overall. HP, it's a pilot. So remember I I said demonstration, pilot production. It's a pilot. I take my hat off to them. They um, It's a nice CERTA HPD joint initiative. Jen Leone at, at um, HPD is a force of nature. I want her on my side through life. I mean, she is so great. And, um, and, and we're paying attention to details. We're developing standards. We have a ton of um, FAQs, which are best practices up on their website. If you Google HPD electrification pilot, you'll come right to it. Right on that landing page is a ton of FAQs, best practices, refrigerant leak prevention, a ton of things. And then we've got requirements, which are the program requirements. You have to do them. Also around installation, design, uh, those are, you know, great, great templates. We're, uh, so we're doing about 50 buildings, both uh, space heating and domestic hot water. We're going to be, you know, nice sort of will be measuring the results of the program. The uptake has been good. I've been very impressed by project teams, by developer teams, by architects, engineers. They, um, it's a generous pilot. I sort of put a good incentive on the table. And um, it's groundbreaking. I think, uh, you know, what we're, we're reviewing drawings, uh, engineering drawings, and I'm seeing a ton of drawings that have all kinds of old fossil fuel details and notes, you know, that, that the, the, the engineers, bless them, still haven't, don't have a lot of experience with heat pumps. So they're leaving these old details, invent details and, and, and notes about gas piping and stuff. And so we have to tell them, take the stuff off your drawings and here are some new details and here are some new uh, specs. I think the design professionals are just learning how, you know, what to use for template specs on their drawings. So HPD electrification pilot, there's a ton of good stuff there. Uh, please feel free to copy and paste stuff onto your drawings um, and credit to N uh, NYSERDA and to HPD for that pilot. What's the timeline for that pilot? It's up and running. We got our first project going into construction, I think in the next few weeks. Projects are closing, they're financing left and right. We have four or five closing financing in June. It's moving nicely. It's it's going to. Uh, they're still open. If you've got a project, affordable housing. Uh, if you've got a project in New York City, multifamily. See me or see Jen Leone. Is anything surprised you so far yet? It's just starting, but. Well, you know, I thought we would be wrestling with where are we going to route the piping and things like that, and instead we're everyone is wrestling with metering issues. How should we meter these things? And the biggest surprise is that, you know, landlords are required to pay heat, but currently tenants, you know, pay air conditioning in the summer because they have their own air conditioners that are on their meter. And the landlords don't want to pay for what now will be air conditioned. You know, it's a tiny bill, but they're all up in arms about it. And so we're bending over backwards, we've come up with three or four or five different options, solutions for that issue. But I was surprised. And so um, this is in electrification. There's so much, there's a need for much more than geeks like me. There's a need for program people. There's a, there's a need for a program design. There's a people for, need for um, educators. You know, I, I keep thinking of everything in terms of heat pumps and engineering, and there's just a lot more happening. So you mentioned the uh, the two ends of the spectrum we're sitting in. You're in a city of 50,000 people. I'm sitting in a city of 8 million plus people. Um, 
What can Ithaca learn from New York City and what can New York City learn from Ithaca? Oh, I'd love to see a local law, some version of local law 97 in, in Ithaca, you know, scale down, obviously our buildings aren't as big, but uh, a, a local law 84 and maybe 87, you know, benchmarking. New York City deserves a lot of credit. You know, it's a tough town. It's all this, you know, there's so many musicals about New York City. It's tough this, it's tough that. What, what New York has done with, uh, with energy and with carbon, whether from Bloomberg on down, you deserve credit for it. It is, it is groundbreaking, groundbreaking. And the state needs to learn from the city. Um, and this, this initiative on existing buildings, initiatives around existing buildings, local law 84, 87, and 97, the whole state should be doing that. Um, and I think New York City, you know, might take a look at our Ithaca Energy Code Supplement. That's for new buildings. IthacaGreenBuilding.com is the website. IthacaGreenBuilding.com. All of the documents are there. The reports are there. You know, the meeting minutes, the whole process. It was a few year process we went through. But the final vote was, I think in the city, it was unanimous that every member of common council voted for a local law requiring fossil fuel free new buildings. January 1st, 2026, unanimous. So the process was good. Um, we, we got about 500 comments and we responded to every single comment. So the, the um, our local sustainability coordinator did a great job to make sure everyone was heard. We sat down with the hospital, we sat down with developers. Um, so I think New York City, you know, maybe can learn something from our process and our new construction, and we can learn something from you all about uh, existing buildings, which, which are gonna be tough. So I'll remind the audience, I have a, just a couple more uh, questions for Ian, and then we'll get to the audience uh, Q&A. Please put it in the box. I see some questions are already uh, coming in in the Q&A box, so please keep those coming. We'll get to those in just a second. So Ian, what do you think is the largest barrier that we need to uh, knock down for electrification, and how do we do it? You know, people keep saying financing is the largest barrier. And I, I think financing is a barrier. I think we make a mistake when, when we think there might be like one big barrier. In fact, there are multiple barriers. Financing is one of them. Um, the, the, the high construction costs, you know, there's no way, this is not, this is not weather stripping windows, right? We've done 40 years of energy work where, well, if you weather strip your windows and you wrap insulation around your water heater, it'll pay for itself in two weeks. You know, that's what we did for 30 years. And we did low cost, no cost. Here are the low cost, no cost things you can do in your home, put on a sweater and turn the thermostat down. You know, th those days are over. We are now getting, we're now, excuse me, getting serious. This is serious construction um, and, and we, we need to be ready for it. The good news is that it's actually not that hard and it's actually not that expensive. That's the good news. NYSERDA is talking about 27 to $30,000 per dwelling unit. You know, that's less than the cost of a kitchen to electrify. And then, uh, and it's good to do some envelope work, some insulation, you know, good to do lighting work. That's very doable. And to put a heat pump in a single family home, in many cases, they can be in and out in single days. It's, on the one hand, it's, it's more than weather stripping. On the other hand, it's actually, really not that hard and it's really not that expensive. We just need to gear up for it. So um, I think we, we need incentives for sure. There's no way a person of low income or even moderate income can turn around 
and spend $30,000 on their home. They can't. We need, so we need financing. We need incentives. And, you know, the federal government recognizes that and the state recognizes that. But we need to get serious about it. We can't, you know, give $500. For years, the federal government was giving $500 for weather stripping your home. They, that's not going to, that's not going to cut it. The 30% solar tax credit that we've had for 30 years, that is serious and that has had an impact. And that's the order of magnitude. We need the federal government, state government putting per home, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars on the table. It it has with finance. And once that happens, this is actually not that hard. And we have lots of people who have done it already, you know. So we have these big goals that we've talked about, um, Ithaca, New York City, New York State, actually the globe, you know, we're, we're talking about is layering up to the Paris Climate Accord, of course. Um, so we've, we've got these big, big goals and challenges that we need to, to, to reach. What gives you hope? What gives you hope as we think about these issues? First of all, I, I don't think it's that hard. Second of all, I think it's an incredible economic opportunity. And I'm not just saying it as an advocate. I will tell you a story. You and I both worked for the same company, right? We both worked for Carrier Corporation, wonderful, all-American company. And um, in 1989, my office was right next to the corporate lobbyist. And those were the days of the facts. So I would pick up his faxes and he would pick up my faxes. And, you know, excuse me, I'm walking his fax to his office. So I read it, you know, I would read his fax. And, and the faxes were coming in from Washington, D.C. We've got to do everything possible to stop this young senator from banning refrigerants, CFC refrigerants, uh, HCFC refrigerants. And that's what Carrier was doing. Full out, full court press to stop the banning of refrigerants. And they failed. And the young senator was Al Gore. And in 1990, you know, we had new laws that went into effect banning refrigerant 11, 12, and ultimately refrigerant 22. And Carrier's business skyrocketed. It took off. I know, I was there. It took off in the 1990s with refrigerant 410A. We basically replaced certainly all the new air conditioners that were being produced. Millions per year went to refrigerant 410A and we've been replacing all the existing ones. It was a fabulous economic story. It, you know, um, they haven't looked back. They've done so well. And, and, uh, and it tells me two things. One is don't stand in the way of change. And, you know, all of the people who are, who are up there, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry is very, very actively resisting this, resisting that. Just get out of the way. You are going to just invest in, you know, train your people in installing heat pumps instead of boilers, and their work is going to skyrocket. And just, you know, get on our side, get on, we're, we're, get on the same side. Um, that gives me hope. We reversed the expansion of the ozone hole. Reversed it. And that gives me great hope. And I think, uh, I think this is going to be a great economic development story. Huge. All right. Let's, uh, let's jump into the audience questions. Um, I have them open here. So we'll just dive right in. Please keep them coming. Um, first one here. Um, in terms of an, uh, of an initiative on readiness to replace when equipment fails, what do you think we can expect to have, or uh, when do you think we can expect to have an adequate line of contractors and equipment ready to respond to the multiple requests in a timely matter in the middle of the night? So we talked about this a little bit, but it's about readiness. I, I think that can happen in short order. I think we need a program, like a certification program. I am a New York State certified um, heat failure contractor. Because the fraction of those failures is actually small, it's not huge. But to, to get the certification, you need to have in stock some safe oil fired 
electric space heaters. And you need to commit to getting on site within um, you know, six hours to distribute those heaters. And then you need to be get you need to have in stock some uh, heat pumps, and you need to commit to installing within a week, something like that. I think that's the program we need, and I think NYSERDA is working on something like that. I was talking to some people a few weeks ago. That's what we need. I don't think that's hard. I think what's harder is to serve all of the demand for heat pumps, not the emergency demand, but all of the demand because right now again it's months to get a heat pump installed um, in Ithaca and um, and I'm assuming that's the same statewide you know we're a little ahead in terms of demand and supply but we we need and I think it's going to be unless we do some kind of a moonshot a workforce development moonshot I think it's unfortunately going to be five ten years before that, that it's one of our biggest bottlenecks okay next question um and you can upvote your question so i've got i've gone to that screen <laughs> so with three upvotes here good question on uh actually several parts here so first one is do cold climate heat pumps work well enough in upstate new york or rural parts of new york um if so, so how do we convince people that's true so absolutely but it's simple physics. It's simple physics. You know, the you just choose the heat pump that's the right size for your building, and that's it. We have hundreds for sure, but I think thousands of heat pumps in Ithaca, where DOE climate six, climate zone six, New York City's DOE climate zone four. We're much colder than New York City. We have hundreds of heat pumps without any backup, working without any problem. They need to be sized correctly. And, and uh, you know, there's, there is a big concern about not oversizing. Everyone is concerned, don't oversize, don't oversize. I think it's hysteria, hysteria. I've been in court twice testifying for equipment that was undersized. I've never been asked to go to court to testify. Uh, this was air conditioning, it wasn't heat pumps. But I've never been asked to testify about equipment that was oversized. There is a minor concern about oversized equipment being less efficient. It's, believe me, it's a very small issue. You don't want to undersize. You want to size to the energy code. The energy code tells you exactly how to size, size to the energy code, put in a safety factor allowed and encouraged by the energy code, and you're fine, totally fine in the coldest climate in the state. We have a manufacturer now that um, they're all good to down to minus 13. They're all of the heat pumps are good, you know, all, all of the cold climate heat pumps are good to minus 13. We have a bunch of them that are good to minus 20, and we've got a new bunch that are good to minus 30. If you're worried about the issue, just go Google and find the ones that work down to minus 30. And if you're in New York City, you know, um, I don't know, get out your bathing suit or something because you're going to be too warm. <laughs> so the second part of that question was about resiliency and, you know, how to think about safety with blackouts and grid issues. So what are your thoughts on that? I think they're valid. I think we need to be aware that uh, any fossil fuel system today, any system, except for a hundred old year old um, octopus furnace, any of them use electricity. You're gonna lose your heating system today if it's fossil fuel, guaranteed. And you're gonna lose your, you know, any capability to do backup with electric resistance. So let's be honest about that. Um, I think investing in envelope measures, you know, insulation and weather stripping and windows is a good idea. Some of the best data I've seen on that has come out of Urban Green. You've got wonderful reports showing how many days a well-insulated building 
is survival because it stays warm. So I think um, taking care of the envelope is a good idea for that reason. And um, in, you know, for, for vulnerable populations, seniors, disabled people, I think we need backup emergency generators with capacity to handle the heat pumps. They will handle the heat pumps way better than electric resistance, I guarantee you, because the heat pump is extracting free heat. So um, I think we just need to be honest about ourselves. We, I think if, you, if it's a vulnerable population, you need to be looking at emergency generators. Next question, how do you think about the need for energy efficiency alongside electrification? Should we be more focused on efficiency while the market and workforce development ramps up for electrification? You know, I, I support and I advocate for envelope work. I just said it's gonna help with survivability and resilience. I think it's a good idea. I think we still have not decided what level of envelope work is right. I think we're looking at a three-legged stool, electrification, conservation, and renewables. That's, and, and we haven't decided what mix is right. In the olden days, we did everything on the basis of payback. What was the best payback? And the best payback, I can tell you today, is just put in a heat pump. That's it. Don't do anything else. We're, we're slowly tiptoeing away from the best payback. But um, we're struggling. We're trying to decide whether a deep energy retrofit, like the uh, Dutch energy sprung, is the right thing to do. And and and, you know, I wrote a report on energy sprung back in 2017 or something. And um, it's an exciting program. It's a valid program. It's a great program in Holland. It's a net zero, external cladding insulation retrofit, deep energy retrofit with solar, with heat pumps. It turns out that our climate is very different than Holland. We need air conditioning, they don't. And that changes everything. Our buildings also have a little more insulation than many of their uninsulated buildings. So porting it to New York State has been harder than expected. And, um, and I don't know where I land. I don't know that we've decided. I don't know that we have a metric to decide what is the right combination of envelope and heat pump. I do know that heat pumps by themselves, if and when the state is clean electricity, you know, will have brought us to where we need to be. Um, but that balance with envelope work, I, I think we're still trying to decide. I, I tend to be a middle of the road kind of guy, but um, I'm also, I, I, if we can bring the cost down of deep energy retrofits, there's a lot to be said for them. All right, next question. Uh, are heat pump hot water uh, systems having the same implementation issues as heat pumps for space heating and cooling? Um, same issues. First of all, we have a huge, huge success story with heat pump water heaters in the basements of single family homes. Hybrid heat pump water heaters have been a dramatic success. Um, I have one in my basement and I measured its efficiency a few weeks ago and it was delivering a, a COP of three. I know that because I, I ran it for a few days in electric resistance mode, and then I ran it as a heat pump. I've had it for about eight years. So I did this experiment. It, it's delivering a fabulous efficiency. I have it running in heat pump only mode. We're four adults in the house. It's a 50 gallon water heater. And we have not run out of water, hot water once in eight years we've had. I have not had a single complaint. And my family, there's plenty of complaints. Um, not a single complaint about hot water, not a single service call in eight years. I think uh, hybrid heat pump water heaters in basements have been a huge success. And anyone with a basement in a single family home, go do it, go do it right away. Um, 
we're starting to see them in multifamily. We don't have quite as many products available. There, um, there were some on the market, then the offshore manufacturers decided to stop selling them. Now they're bringing them back again. We don't have a huge selection, but we do have products and it's ready to go. They're ready to go. And I think, again, you and I do a lot of multifamily stuff. I think in multifamily, it's a huge, um, hugely simple. You just replace the heater down in the basement. That's it. You don't even need to go into apartments and put the outdoor unit up on the roof and you're done. So I think hot water heating, we're, we're still getting, kind of getting used to the products, but I think we're ready to go. I'd like to see more product selection, but there are products out there. We're, we're specifying them. They're ready to go. Um, don't know if that answered the question. Um, you know, we'd like to see incentives. We'd like to see more workforce. But um, if you're trying to decide what to do, you know, I, I would do hot water first. And whether it's single family, multifamily, certainly commercial buildings, they don't use much hot water. But um, I hotels, I would do definitely dip your toe in, pull it out of your central boiler system and take care of hot water first. All right, next question is from our friend, Dick Lee. Dick wants to know about costs, cost sharing. So it's a good question. He says, thinking about electrifying apartment heat years ago, we thought that having the resident pay would be a strong driver against waste. And some market buildings do that today. Would you expand on the issue of paying for air conditioning um, for what's coming, what's in store and possibly, you know, how different housing markets could approach both heat and air conditioning from a from a who pays standpoint. Um, I'll okay. I'll I'll start with the general multimeter uh, master metered versus direct meter, and I'll go out on a limb and I'll make a case that I've made um, a, a few times that we should not be scared of master metered. Don't be scared of master meat. Throw everything on. It's, it's totally fine to throw everything on the owner's meter. You don't have to. There's benefits to individual meter. But I'm going to make a case for master meat. When it's master metered, the owner is paying the bill. The owner has an incentive then to maintain the heat pump to maintain the building, to add insulation, to go and get renewables. The owner has an incentive. What is that incentive ultimately for the owner? The, what is the elasticity? The elasticity is 100% of the energy use of that building. That's what's in it for the owner if they're paying the bill. What's, what's the elasticity for a resident? they can turn the temperature down and put on a sweater. They can't maintain the equipment other than clean the filter. They can't replace the equipment. They can't insulate the building. They can't change the windows. Their elasticity is about five or 10%. If they're a real slob, it might be 20%. That's it. If they're a real slob, they'll turn the temperature up to 75. We have good temperature monitoring data for years of data uh, from NYSERDA programs that showed that overheating in New York City is, is a problem, but it's, it's the exception where it's 80 degrees. There's a lot of 72 degree stuff, 73 degree stuff, but 80 degrees, you know, where the tenants are wearing shorts and the windows are open, it hurts us to see it. Well, every time we see a window open in, in, in a window open in winter, it hurts us. It rubs us the wrong way, but it's in fact the exception to the rule. And so I want to make the case that there's a lot to be said for master metered with some incentives and some limits put on, you know, temperature limiting thermostats, put limits on what happens in the apartment. 
that's the case I'm making for Master Meter. Now I realize that um, some people just cannot live with that and they just cannot trust tenants. Um, and so, you know, direct metered works, works fine. Um, in, the, in the case of air conditioning, so, so now we've gone master metered, but we're trying to uh, we're trying to deal with this issue of, of the landlord now paying for the air conditioning. There's multiple solutions. There's one solution that people are doing where they're providing two power supplies to the heat pump. And in the summertime, they switch the power supply over to the tenant. I'm not crazy about it. Uh, it's, it, it can be done. We've looked at it. Can, uh, it can be done legally in compliance with the uh, National Electric Code. I'm not crazy about it. I don't think it's that safe. I think there's a chance that somebody's going to come, uh, or a uh, service technician is going to come, they're going to cut the power you know, one power supply and not cut the other one, and they're going to work on live equipment. And so we're going to need all kinds of warning signs or extra switches. I'm not crazy about it. Construction cost, I'm not crazy about safety. Um, there are other solutions. We've listed several of them on the HPD uh, pilot website. All right. Um... Hi, Dick. Dick's, Dick's my mentor. I've learned every, everything I know I learned from Dick. <laughs> We're getting close to the end. So I'm going to start to group some of these questions. There's a lot of questions around grid readiness for electrification. I have my own answer, and we actually have our own research for that in New York City that I can talk about. But maybe from your perspective statewide, you know, what should we be concerned about grid readiness when it comes to electrification? We should, and I think we're doing all the right things. First of all, we're a summer peaking state. And so this issue is not a 2023 issue. What is a 2023 issue is we need to get going with electrifying and decarbonizing. But grid readiness is not a 2023 issue. It's going to be a few years before we hit our grid capacity and that we become winter peaking. And we're doing all the right things. I'm seeing products being rolled out that I'm super excited about. First of all, domestic hot water, you know, they're already, we're doing thermal storage. And if we do, if we, I'd like to see us outlaw electric resistance backup for um, water heaters. We don't need them. We don't need them. If you size the tank the right size, and that will reduce the uh, the um, power draw for water heating uh, relative to electric resist. So we're already doing some storage there. We can do more there. I saw a product come out, an induction stove with a battery in it. What a brilliant idea, 110 volts. And it stores energy to use to, to cook your food. So you don't need a 50 amp circuit breaker. You don't need to upgrade your uh, electrical panel. What a brilliant idea. I'm already seeing great activity around grid readiness. The utilities certainly are scratching their heads. Um, I think we're doing all the right things. It's not my biggest concern. We do need to think about it. It's not my biggest concern. And there's a ton of activity already around thermal storage and electric storage. Great. And I'll just put a plug in for Urban Green's Grid Ready Report for the audience to take a look on our website. Um, we modeled all 1 million buildings in New York City against the Con Ed grid to, under, to answer this question. And of course, just at the high level, what we find is there's a 42% differential between the summer peak and the winter peak in New York City. Um, so that means there's 42% headroom to start plugging things into the grid from a heat perspective. Um, so to echo Ian's point, plenty of time before we need to think about master grid issues over overall. Um, yeah, this is a good question going back to your uh, NYCHA issue. What's the what's the largest challenge associated with ro uh, routing the condensate into the airstream for the window heat pumps? Um, can, it, can it not be done similar to window uh, room air conditioner systems? It's hard because in the winter, in the summer, we just spray it on the outdoor heat exchanger and it evaporates. 
perfect. It's easy. It increases the efficiency of the air conditioner. It's easy. In the winter, it's the indoor heat exchanger that is hot. I myself am totally fine taking this distilled water and putting it on the indoor coil. I have no problem with that. It'll humidify the indoors. It'll work well. It'll increase the efficiency of the heat pump. Somebody is going to come along and scream mold, is going to scream indoor air quality. And then the whole thing's going to grind to a halt. So I myself don't have any problem dripping it on the indoor heat exchanger, but I think there is reluctance to do that. So now we need to spray it into the cold outdoor air stream. And I think uh, people are, you know, people are starting to give that thought. Um, I think dripping it outdoors down a pipe might actually work because, um, but we need to prove it to make sure it doesn't freeze. But that may work and it may be super easy but it's no longer something that a homeowner can do picking up the unit from Best Buy. That's the, that's the home run we're looking for, right? Um, and, and we can always drain it indoors. We're draining all of our split system fan coils. We're draining all of them. So we can drain it indoors. NYCHA said, we don't wanna do that. We don't wanna, we don't wanna deal with asbestos. We don't want to deal with drilling hole, wall, holes in walls or floors. Let's go out the window. Okay, final question here. What are the common hiccups that occur during heat pump installation and early operation? Early operation. I'll tell you an experience I had. Um, I electrified a little duplex we own and the contractor forgot to run power to the two new electric stoves. So we turned the whole system on and that night I get a call from the tenants. My stove, I can't cook, my stove doesn't have power. So I had to call the contractor, you forgot to hook up power to the stove. Then um, about a year later, a tenant in a small bedroom that I decided, don't tell anyone, I decided to put in a short strip of electric resistance heat because it was up some stairs and it was hard to reach with a heat pump. Tenant calls me up, my, my bedroom's cold a year later. So I said, we, we went and we looked at, and the contractor forgot to hook up power to that heater. Okay. Then I found, I was, I was, I was in the basement looking at, the, uh, looking at some old equipment and I see that the gas pipe that had come to the old boiler wasn't capped. They had shut the gas pipe off, the gas valve, but they hadn't capped the gas pipe. What that means was that if some child came along and opened that gas valve, that house would have exploded. Okay. These are some of the hiccups we're looking at so that there is some importance around quality control. We're seeing pipe penetrations, refrigerant pipe penetrations coming through walls that aren't sealed. That happened also at that house. These are the hiccups we're seeing, just quality control issues. We'll, we'll work them out, but they're, they're a pain in the butt. All right, well, Ian, you haven't been a pain in the butt, so I wanna thank you for, for joining us for this uh, tremendous discussion, and I uh, really wanna thank you for spending some of your morning with us here at Urban Green. We really appreciate you're, it. You're welcome, and I'll make a plug for Urban Green. What you guys do research-wise, advocacy-wise, social-wise, bringing people together. I haven't seen anything like it. We need that up in Ithaca. And uh, I'll take my hat off to you. You guys are a pleasure to work with. Thank you. We really appreciate that. We have a great conference coming up, if we can pull that up, that actually will continue some of the conversation we had today. Um, so our conference is on June 8th at NYU. It's uh, NYC Next, Trends for Changing City. We're going to dive into three topics. One is making uh, all electric buildings, how to make all electric buildings more resilient. And that was the topic of many of the questions today. So tune in for that. The uh, other two topics are going to be how we, um, how we transform office buildings to residential, that conversion, how we do that sustainably. 
And the other topic is going to be diving into uh, making net zero a reality. So in-person conference at NYU, um, always a great event, always sells out. So uh, get your registration in early. So that takes us at the top of our hour. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your time. Hope you learned something new. Hope you found it valuable. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the next Urban Green event. Everybody have a great day. Stay safe.